All right, welcome back everybody. Today we are going over some of the questions y'all wanted answers to, and y'all asked some really great questions. Uh, some of them, I could literally make a video on that question specifically itself, but I wanted to do this kind of quick and answer as many questions as I could in this short amount of time, so let's not waste any more time and let's just jump into it. What happens when you gotta poop? We all do it, it happens. All right, well, You've got three options. Well, I take it back, you got four options. Option number one, you can fight it off. Option number two, if you got a bathroom near you, go to the bathroom. Number three, you can take a water poop. Or number four, my preference, you can go back to the dunes and take a poop. <laughs> that's, that's, that's your options. It sucks, no, nobody wants to do it, but when nature calls, life happens. How many setups or rods is enough? and should I throw spoons or jigs while waiting and I'm not getting any bites. As, as far as rod setups go, I typically throw three out when it's just me. It's just an easy number to keep track of. I, I know what distance they're at, what bait's on them. And another thing you gotta let dictate how many rods you throw out is how crowded is the beach. I mean, if it's a just packed to the gills, probably should keep your rods limited, maybe two or three at most. If you and a buddy are out there, you know, you can each throw out a couple rods. I mean, you could have up to six rods if there's a couple of you, whatever you want to do. Um, if the action's really busy, like it's nonstop, there's times when you may only be able to keep one or two rods out there. And as far as throwing lures while you're waiting on your set rigs, absolutely. I, I do it all the time, especially when the bluefish are running and I know I can throw a spoon out there and find some bluefish. Typically, you're going to have your set rigs set in, in what should be the best area. So a lot of times when you're throwing lures with set rigs, you're off to the side a little bit and you're not really fishing the prime target area you're set up on, but it's definitely a great thing to do. What are the effects of tides in fish feeding activity and movement in and out of the surf? Okay, tidal movement is super important and you'll have a lot of people tell you it's not along the Gulf Coast because our, our tides from low tide to high tide might be a foot, but you gotta look at it this way. If say low tide, you got a little trough here in front of the nearest sandbar to the beach and at low tide, you got six inches of water. Now let's turn it to high tide and that six inches of water is all of a sudden a foot and a half of water. Now fish can go in and out of there. You, your target species are coming closer to the beach now because there's more water that they can hide in that water. They, they feel more comfortable, even though it's just a foot of water, they absolutely will come in closer and feel more comfortable. Now take a neap tide, for example. Neap tide stands for near even as possible. So from low tide to high tide, we might have two inches of water. That's all the change that happens. That's just the way a neap tide works. It happens and we gotta deal with it. Nobody likes to fish a neap tide because there's just hardly any water movement. When you have a neap tide, you gotta look down that beach. You gotta, and you may have to walk forever, but you gotta find moving water. As long as the water's moving, you have a chance of catching fish. Now, I'm not saying you can't catch fish on a neat tide. I, I do it all the time because I will fish a neat tide. I, I don't care. I, I will fish any tide. I don't care if it's low tide, high tide, neat tide. I'm just gonna get out there and fish because you just never know when you're gonna find fish on what level the tide is at. How does one best organize their beach slash fishing cart? Okay, first things first. If you have your own surf fishing cart, you're never gonna be satisfied with it. You are gonna constantly change stuff. You're gonna add this, you're gonna add that, you're gonna take that away, you're gonna add something else. It's a never ending process. I've probably had 10 configurations of my cart for the past two years. It's just something fun to do, something fun to modify. But the best way to organize it is just keep it simple. You do not need to bring every fish and item you own. And I see a lot of people do that. I've been guilty of it at times. If you're just gonna target pompano and whiting, leave that 8,000 size reel at home. You don't need to be bringing a bunch of shark rigs. You don't need to be bringing a bunch of dot hooks. Leave that stuff at home unless you specifically plan on targeting maybe sharks or red drum. All right, one little thing I do, I will take whatever I need for the day. And if it doesn't fit in a backpack, I'm not gonna pack it. I don't wanna have a backpack, a, a tackle box, two coolers, all that stuff. I, I don't like that, it's just too much you're gonna wear yourself out carrying it all down the beach. So if you don't need it, leave it at home. Another little option is these little ammo cans, these little ammo boxes, they're great. You can absolutely fit what you need for a day of surf fishing in one of these, hands down. Any lures you need, any rigs, weights, 
it will fit in one of these boxes, what you need for that specific day. If you, if you can't fit it in here, you're probably taking too much. Now, if you plan on targeting, you know, pompano, you want to throw some cut bait for reds, you want to throw lures, then yeah, you're going to have to bring all that stuff, but you don't need 30 spoons. You don't need 30 top water poppers. You know, just, just bring a couple for the day. That, that's all you really need. You don't need to pack all the extras. Keep some of that weight out of the cart. Your legs are going to thank you at the end of the day. And if it's a good day of fishing, you might have 10, 15 pounds of fish that you've added to your cart throwing fish in the cooler. So remember that on a good day, your cart will be heavier going back home than it was coming out. So keep that in mind. How long did it take you to learn to read the structure? Um, it, it's an ever evolving skill set. It changes from season to season. It changes from beach to beach. You have to read high tide a little bit different than low tide because some of the structure at high tide doesn't show up like it does at low tide. The swell, the surf, the waves, the size of the waves, that has an impact on how you read the surf. If you've just barely got some wave action, you're really gonna have to search for it. If you have huge wave action, it can hide a lot of structure. It's just one of those ever evolving things that you just have to get out there and you have to look at the beach every time you're out. Just keep reading it. You, you know, I mean, you're gonna see those waves breaking on the shallow spots. You're gonna see those flat areas on the deeper spots. You're gonna see darker water in the deeper spots. It's just an ever evolving skill. I don't think you ever 100% master it in an area. And the reason is the surf structure is in a chaotic state. It never stays the same. From one day to the next, you're not really gonna have much change in the surf unless all of a sudden, like today we have one foot waves and tomorrow we have five foot waves. That's gonna move a ton of sand and it's gonna change the beach structure. But it's one of those things like you gotta be able to read the beach at high tide. High tide, some of that structure, it's hidden because there's more water there and the waves aren't reacting to the, the sand structure. Low tide, some of those areas are gonna show up really, really well for you because the, the waves do break on that structure. And if the water's flat at low tide, but it's breaking here, it's breaking here, but right here, it's flat at low tide, you know you've got a deeper area there. It's significantly deeper, especially if it's flat at low tide. So at high tide, you know you're gonna have even more water there. But it, it is, it's an ever evolving skill because on, on a flat day with like one foot waves, it looks different than a, than a heavy day with three to four foot waves. But the, the best teacher of how to read the surf is to get out there and read it with your own eyes. Now, real quick, if y'all are enjoying this, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, make some comments down below because the more interaction you give the channel, the more it grows. So absolutely hit all those buttons, do all those things for me. I will greatly appreciate it. But let's get back to some questions. How do you solidly identify a rip? Now, the best way to identify a rip is you will literally see water flowing back out to sea. You're gonna have all this wave action coming into the beach, you know? You got these waves breaking over here, you got these waves breaking over here, and you'll just see this area. You'll just see water. It, it almost looks like a river. It, I mean, you will have a backwards flow of water going out to the open ocean. And one thing to always look for is that that waves are crashing on that sandbar and there's a flat area there, there's gonna be some water flowing out in that in that cut, in that sandbar. Even if you can't really see that water flowing back out, the water is always gonna take the path of least resistance and it's gonna go out from that cut. Now, for some reason, people think that there's just rip currents everywhere. And I mean, there are, there, there's little rip currents that you never even see, that you never even know of. But for some reason, we just wanna see this big, wide open area where you just see like, it looks like a river rushing out. And we don't really have rip currents like that very often. They're extremely rare. So the things you really wanna look for are cuts in the sandbar. If you have a cut in the sandbar, that water's taking the path of least resistance out. And also literally look for water that is flowing out. I mean, it's, it's not gonna be just gushing out, breaking waves the other way, but you will see just that gentle flow of water going back out to sea. When do you prefer to go out, morning or evening? which in your personal experience has been the most productive. Now my situation's a little different. Um, for me and my family, it is easier for me to go out first thing of the morning. It's just overall, we've got sports and stuff at night and we've got school activities and, and whatever, and just, and just life in general. Just, we live here, so we don't, we're not on vacation time while we're here. I mean, this, we have to live our normal lives down here. So first thing of the morning works best for me. But to be honest, I don't think morning or evening is any better than the other. I've had 
excellent mornings. I've had terrible mornings. I've had excellent evenings. I've had terrible evenings. The best time to get out there and fish is whenever you can. And whether that's, you can get out first thing of the morning for one hour and, and that's why you can fish. That's the best time to fish for you. If you have to fish at midday, which is my least favorite time to fish, then you gotta get out at midday. You just, you gotta get out there whenever you can because you literally never know when the fish are gonna bite. You can go from four hour skunk to all of a sudden the next 30 seconds you catch a limit of pompano or whatever. You just literally have no idea when a school of fish is gonna come by and turn a terrible day of fishing into a great day. How do you find out where you are allowed to surf fish and where are you not allowed to surf fish? Now here in Alabama, anything below the mean high tide line is owned by the state and you are 100% allowed to be there. But the key to getting there is you have to access that through public access. You can't cut through somebody's house. You can't, you know, you can't walk under somebody's house to get to that access. You've got to go from a public access. So that means from where you park to that high tide line, there is a stretch of public access. So you're it's typically a boardwalk area. Now there is a section of beach in the city of Gulf Shores, the city owned beaches, which if you're familiar with the area is the hangout, that whole beach front through there. They actually, the Gulf Shore city itself doesn't allow fishing on their beach. Um, but basically anywhere else in Alabama, as long as you can stay on public ground, and get below that mean high tide line, you can fish. How far away from swimmers should you be for their protection and, the, and for the fish not to be spooked? Now, when it comes to swimmers, if you're in an area and you can avoid them, absolutely just stay as, stay as far away as you can. Because if even if it's not our fault, but some swimmer gets into our lines, gets tangled, gets hooked, the swimmer doesn't get blamed for it, we get blamed for it. So what I typically try to do, I try to, try to avoid fishing the high traffic areas where there's just gonna be a lot of people going to the beach. And there are some places where I like to fish, but they do become high traffic areas. That's another reason why I like to get out first thing of the morning, just because you don't have the beach crowd. But if, if I get out to the beach and I see an area I really wanna fish, but there's people swimming there, even, even if they're 20, 30, 40 yards off to the side, I will go at least 100 yards away from those swimmers just to avoid any confrontation. And I think that's just a, a good general rule. Just if, if there's swimmers there, they beat you there, go somewhere else. If you're at a beach and I mean, it just gets so crowded that I mean, for 500 yards, there's nothing but swimmers. There's not much you can do about it. I personally would just pack up and call it a day or I would go to a different location where maybe it's not as crowded. Now, a lot of y'all ask me what size of hook, what brand of hook do I use for everything from whiting, pompano, redfish, shark. When it comes to whiting, I like to use nothing bigger than a size two circle hook. That's not a two watt, it's a size two. A two watt hook's this big, a size two is this big. You gotta remember that. If you got that ought, like two dash zero, those hooks are bigger than just a straight two. Anything with the ought, like a one ought, two ought, three ought, those hooks get bigger when you don't have that odd, if it's just a size one hook, two, three, four, five, and so on, as those numbers go up, that way those hooks actually get smaller. So remember that if you're ordering hooks online or something. Now, when it comes to whiting, I like to use really small hooks. And I have some specific setups that I use to target whiting. Um, I will not use anything bigger than a size two circle hook. And in fact, my, my go-to right now is just the size four. It's really small. Now, if a big redfish gets on it, am I gonna get that redfish in? Probably not. It's probably gonna straighten out my hook or it might break my 10 pound line because I go really light on the line with my widening rigs as well. Now, when it comes to pompano, I use a pretty wide spectrum of hooks. Sometimes I'll use a size one circle hook. Um, but for the most part, if, if it's a rig I'm tying myself, I'll use a one off or a two watt, but I just got a lot of one watt hooks. But when I use one, like if I use a Salty's Pompano rig, they're a size two watt. Two watt is probably the most versatile hook size, to be honest. Even small whiting can even get hooked on them, and you can also catch a, a giant redfish on it. It's just that perfect right there in the middle of the road size hook. Now, if I am targeting red drum, black drum, I'm gonna go with at least a five aught just because I like to use bigger baits. And if you have a big bait with a little hook, sometimes you can't get that barb exposed and fish will hit your bait. But if that barb doesn't get caught in that lip, then what good was that hook for you? 
Um, when it comes to sharks, I think I'm using a nine knot circle hook right now for sharks with the rigs I made up. I'm not 100% positive, but for sharks, I wouldn't go any smaller than an eight knot hook. Uh, just a, a minimum eight knot hook. You just want a heavy hook because sharks are powerful. They're, they're gonna test your gear a little bit. So just make sure you use a big heavy gauged hook. And again, the same thing, you're using a pretty good hunk of bait. So you gotta have enough hook so that barb's exposed to get in that shark's mouth. All right, hopefully you all enjoyed that. And if you did, make sure you comment down below. I mean, let, let me have some feedback on this. I, I wanna keep doing these questions and answers if you guys enjoyed it. And, and I wanna help you out as much as I can. So there, there are some questions that are super complex and they're difficult to answer. And then there's other questions that are super simple and I can answer them in five seconds. But just ask me anything and I will go through and I will pick what I think are the best questions that will help the broadest range of people and I will keep doing these videos. But I need your feedback if I'm gonna keep doing it. So let me know down below, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share this video to everybody. But I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this video up. So until next time, I'll see you later.